Hi everyone, it's David from Automotive Press. As you guys know, I love trucks, especially full-size trucks, but there has been a lot of interesting conversation lately because of the Toyota Tundra recall. More on that later on. But the big question people are asking me is should they consider other full-size trucks even if they are, let's say, a loyal Toyota fan because of the issues associated with the current Tundra. So for example, I'm driving the Ford F-150 which is the best-selling truck in North America, for that matter, best-selling vehicle in North America. Should you consider this or the GMC or Chevrolet trucks or maybe even the Ram trucks? Those are some interesting questions that I would like to address today. But first and foremost, I will come back and talk a little bit more about the Tundra recall because that's the elephant in the room that I have to address. I'm not going to get into a lot of details because we're still speculating a little bit at this point, but at least I can give you a little bit more insight about that and then you can decide whether you still want to buy Toyota Tundra or you want to consider something like Ford F-150, which I actually think is one of the best buys right now. So let's get into more details right now. Let's go. Welcome back. So let me quickly address the whole Toyota Tundra recall first, and then I'm gonna talk more about the F-150, which I think is one of the best buys in the full-size truck market. Please keep in mind that I am just giving you my professional opinion on this matter, so Please don't crucify me because I don't have all that information yet. We're still speculating and not all the data is out in terms of what's happening with the recall. But I would like to give you some insight anyway based on what I know so far and what I can figure out from my engineering experience. So the first thing to keep in mind is some mysteries surrounding the recall which involved not just the Toyota Tundra but also involved the Lexus LX600. The LX is built in Japan at the Yoshiwara plant, which is the plant that produces both the LX and also the 300 series Land Cruiser. But the Tundra, as you know, is built in the Texas plant in their San Antonio factory, which also built other versions of the Tundra, including the Hybrid and TRD Pros, and also built a Sequoia. So the question is, why would the LX be affected along with the Tundra when they're built in the two different factories? Well, the simple answer is the fact that they're both using similar or almost identical machining process and identical production process which they would have developed in Japan and then figure out how to do it the best way for both US Toyota and Japan Toyota and they would have implemented those in the factory. So if one equipment or one process has a problem due to machining process then that problem will be replicated with another location because it's using the same equipment. Also keep in mind that the two engines may be using parts from their suppliers which makes some precision parts for the engine and those machine parts would come from a supplier, potentially the same supplier that is supplying both the Japan and the US factory and so that could be another reason why the LX is affected along with the Tundra. Uh, but many other questions remain such as why are the hybrids not affected and could they be affected in the future and also is this 100,000 number truly representative of what's going on. So even though I don't have all the facts in front of me, what I can say is that the hybrid engines are designed identical to non-hybrid, not including the hybrid component. So the engine components are the same. So if you have a problem with uh, non-hybrid, there is a potential that the problem could have also occurred with the hybrid. But because the hybrid numbers are so small and also they produce later in the year, by that time, maybe the problems got resolved. So it's a little bit hard to say in terms of the hybrids could be recalled later on. My suspicion is that it could be expanded, uh, but um, it's also possible that they might have taken care of the issue by the time the hybrids hit higher volume. So I would say it's a 50-50 chance. Uh, but what about in terms of number? Well, there's 100,000 give or take units um, recalled for both Tundra and uh, LX, very small number for LX. But so far, based on what I can gather from the government uh, documents, uh, are that about 830 were documented at a dealership to have some of these issues out of 100,000. And many, many months have passed since those documentations were recorded. So there may not be that much more from what I can gather. That's again my speculation. So let's say give or take another couple hundred. So maybe 1,000 to 2,000 units could be affected out of 100,000. Again, this is my big guess. So I guess I do want to stress that it's not all 100,000 units that are going to be affected. And you might wonder, could they be affected later on if you keep on driving? Uh, yes, the crankshaft bearing could continue to wear out and you could eventually have that problem even though you don't have that problem right now. But it's been a couple of years now since the uh, early onset of this problem have um, started. 
which is starting in 2022. So if you haven't um, seen the problem by now in your truck, if you happen to own Tundra, then I think you're probably one of the safer ones and you might not be affected. So again, we don't know the exact number, but out of the 100,000 units, it could be a couple thousand units or so. So it's not all 100,000 production cars that will likely have this issue. The other thing to keep in mind is that traditionally speaking, whether it's Toyota or Ford or any other brands, whenever they introduce new or almost new engine, especially in new or almost new body and a new platform, there's always some issues that will end up being recalled. For example, even my Lexus LC500, which has been around for a long time with very little changes, already had three recalls. The Toyota Supra I had had six or seven recalls. Uh, even the Lexus GX that I have had one or two recalls. And then the RAV4 Prime that we own, also very reliable, had at least four recalls. So I think volunteer recalls is what they call it. Tends to happen quite a bit earlier in the production ramp up but it also happens with mature vehicles. And so I think people are panicking about the recalls, but to be honest, it's part of everyday life in the oil industry. You just have to figure out uh, how to deal with it, whether there will be a proper fix for it, and also whether it's affecting a huge number or not. And we don't have enough information to answer those questions yet. So if you are one of the persons that's affected within the recall because you own a Tundra, I would, uh, first of all, look for any kind of uh, issues and symptoms that's related to this problem, such as engine knocking or strange sound coming from the engine bay or loss of power. If you experience any of those things, take it right away to your local Toyota dealership and then get it looked after so that you don't get into a situation where the engine might stall, which wouldn't be a safe thing to do. By the way, you might wonder why would there be machining debris inside the engine? Well, actually that's pretty normal and common for any kind of machining work, there's always some debris and usually there's supposed to be some method and system to take them out before it's assembled. But in this particular case, there was uh, still some left. Now again, that's pretty normal and usually when you change your oil or uh, oil filter, these things get filtered out. But for some reason, there's a little bit more than average amount of debris inside and therefore there's additional load on the crankshaft bearing because these little debris can get lost into the, uh, the crankshaft bearing uh, or affect the whole um, running of the engine itself. And so we don't have enough data. I don't have enough data to be able to figure out why that is the case. It has to be to do with the production process in terms of how it is clearing out this debris using some other method and somehow it wasn't sufficient. And they did discover this uh, prior to the recall. And so they have already placed some changes to the processes and therefore I don't think that this problem will occur in future Tundras but it's obviously affecting Tundras that were produced for 2022 and 2023 model year. So those are things I can talk about. I don't want to keep on talking about the recall because I do want to talk about the F-150 but I did want to address a few things that are in the minds of people. I think we're going to get more and more information as time goes and therefore uh, I'll be able to answer some of those questions later on when I have more facts and data because I don't want to speculate based on things we don't know yet. Uh, and the only thing I can say is that more than any other company, Toyota is absolutely on top of fixing something and doing what we call Kaizen, which is continuous improvement. So more than any other company, I still have a confidence that Toyota will at least fix this, regardless of the intensity of the problem. They'll get it right, they'll fix it quickly, and it'll be done 100% correct once it's fixed. And so you might have to just wait a little bit and see what happens. I don't think this is a sign that the whole Tundra lineup is, you know, is not worth keeping anymore or it's going to have a lot more problems. I don't really believe that. I think this is a bit of an isolated incident and that even though we had some other problems earlier in the Tundra's um, ramp up, they all got fixed and they didn't affect a huge number of cars. So I'm actually still confident that you'll get solved and we just move on with our life. So uh, don't panic yet, more information to come. Let's come back to Ford F-150 because people are asking me, due to some of the recalls they're hearing about the Tundra, should they consider Ford F-150? And my answer right now is absolutely, because until this problem is solved and until we know for sure what the issue is and the root cause and the solution for it, yeah, maybe don't buy the Tundra, uh, at least in the hybrid version for a few months because I think in July they're going to announce the solution for that problem. If you're in a rush to buy a truck right now or in general you're a little bit um, hesitant about buying a Tundra because of that, buy the Ford F-150. It is definitely the best 
truck in the market because it is the best selling one. It's got good resale value. It's facelifted for 2024 with new engines, new features, new technology. This one I'm driving is a base model, but it's got a lot of features on it and it's only $69,000 Canadian, which is ridiculously cheap considering what you get for this full size truck. I love the EcoBoost 2.7 liter twin turbo V6 engine as well. So they're not cramming a turbo four in here uh, and it's a beautiful engine, very smooth, comfortable. And I'll talk a little bit more about the ride right after this in terms of how it feels on the road. But just based on my engineering audit and inspection so far, this F-150 is actually quite well built. I, I'll do a quick uh, check here. 3.5 millimeter there, 3.8 millimeters of gap, but definitely a little bit wide, but not all that different from Tundra. But it looks pretty good here at 3.5, 3.7, and 3.7 uh, millimeter and it's reasonably well lined up. Paint job has a little bit of a uh, orange peel though, and so I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's a top notch, but the basic build quality looks good. Most of all, I think the best part of F-150 is the way it drives and the practicality and the functionality of the F-150 because there's so many different versions of this, including the Raptor, which is a high performance version, but also many different configuration in terms of length, in terms of the features and so forth. And those are what makes F-150 quite attractive. Let's talk more about this inside the vehicle. So now I'm inside a F-150 facelifted with many changes for 2024. This is the STX series, which is more or less a base model with some options on it. Again, 69,000 Canadian gets you a lot of truck. And I feel like in terms of dollar for value right now, F-150 represent the best price and the best value uh, because you can get decent amount of features uh, even for the base model like this one, including a 12.3 inches uh, screen, uh, even the digital cluster here as well as the 2.7 liter twin turbo V6 engine. I'm thankful that they're staying with the V6, not downsized to turbo four. As you know, some of the General Motors full-size trucks uses turbocharged four-cylinder engine. And all the features you expect in F-150 is here. Big knobs, good um, clicky feel, um, nice and large cup holders, storage spaces, also big center console as you can see, huge, huge amount of space. You can easily put laptop and some tools in here and most of you guys already know that Ford has this feature that can fold this way and give you a flat surface. And unlike last year, this te texture is now has a kind of rubberized coating. So if you have a laptop or some other stuff, it won't slide away. Previously, it was just a slippery plastic. So they made a whole bunch of changes, big cup holder in the back and storage here as well. And also pretty large glove compartment as well. So practicality wise and functionality wise, I think the interior is better designed than Toyota Tundra. And in fact, I think it is the most practical of all the full size trucks I've reviewed the last couple of years. And uh, it's just uh, really well designed and even the quality is actually pretty good. I see a little bit of a gap here and there, but generally speaking, all the parts fit well. They made some changes so that there's a nice texture here, not a smooth, shiny, hard plastic. And you got this kind of a, a, a sort of dark, glossy um, accent. Again, not glossy black. So they made sure that, you know, that this surface is functional. In fact, you have many different surfaces. This textured one, you got bronze here, dark gray, and then another texture over here by the ventilation that looks like a simulated wood. So they combine many different materials to give a very uh, three-dimensional feel to it. And I think they've done a really good job with, uh, I uh, commend Ford for taking what's already popular and then making it better and better in some way, a little bit like Toyota, which is a continuous improvement principle. And the seats are very comfortable even on this base unit and all the controls are within easy reach. So uh, once again, F-150, is number one selling truck in fact number one selling vehicle in north america for very simple reason that it provides a lot of value practicality lots of space in the back very comfortable and all the things you might want either from an suv or a truck you can get it in this particular truck so you don't have to end up with both suv and truck in your uh, garage you can just have one truck and it does the functionality of both truck and suv because it's quite comfortable and I found that uh, over the bumpy road, it stays very stable. So let's go for a quick drive and I can tell a little bit more about the drivability of this F-150. So I'm on the road now with F-150 and somehow we suddenly hit a bit of a rainstorm here. So it's a bit loud, 
but I think when you drive the F-150 and you drive the Tundra, you also drive the Ram and then the Chevrolet and the GMC twin four-side trucks, you kind of understand why people loved F-150 so much. It's not that it is substantially better than any other trucks, but it has a good balance to everything. There's nothing annoying or strange about F-150 that might bother you. It has all the features you want. The handling is predictable and balanced. The ride is extremely comfortable. The engine performs well even with this base 2.7 liter engine, which is twin turbocharged by the way, with uh, 325 horsepower. And everything about this car is predictable. No surprises. And in the auto industry, no surprises are a good thing because it's sometimes you have a car that performs really well in one or two things, but they also do not very well in other aspects, and that's what annoys owners. Whereas F-150, it's hard to criticize. Quiet, performs well. I like the engine. It's more than peppy enough. The ride is almost equivalent to what you'll get in SUV in the sense that it's predictable and um, it doesn't lose its composure when you're driving over some bumpy road. And even though it's a big four-side truck, it doesn't actually feel all that big. It's reasonably agile, and therefore you feel like you're driving a smaller truck. And those are all the strength of the F-150, and so it's hard to fault this truck. And if you want to buy something that's proven, something that everyone really likes to own, and you want to buy something that has many different configurations so you can have it your own way, then F-150 is probably the answer for many of you guys. I like it better than the GMC uh, Chevrolet trucks, although I think they have a really good handling and I love the way they handle on the road. Uh, and I also like it better than Ram because I think the F-150 has been more reliable than the Ram series. And if I compare once again to Tundra, it performs better. I, I think the balanced feel and overall drivability is a little bit better than the Tundra although Tundra has its own strength as well as I have pointed out many times in the past. So right now if you want to buy a full-size truck and you're not quite sure what's happening with the Toyota Tundra and you don't want to wait a few months to find out whether they solve the problem completely then yeah I would say F-150 is probably a safe buy and you might be surprised to hear from me that I might actually recommend F-150 over Tundra but at this moment in time that's what I feel like I should do. And once the problem is solved and Toyota has a good grasp of what's happening with uh, this machining debris and all the things are back to normal, then yeah, I might change my mind and recommend the Tundra again, uh, maybe even over the F-150. But as I stand now, this is a truck to buy. It's a good price, good value, well-balanced feel, and you can have it in many different ways. And that makes the F-150 stand out among the many full-size trucks that are available today. So I hope you enjoyed that video. I know I should talk a little bit more about the Tanja Rico, but there's only so much I can say for now because I don't have all the facts either and I don't want to speculate too much. I don't want to come across like I'm defending Toyota or defending anyone for that matter. I just want it to be straightforward and to be honest and transparent about what I know and what I think is happening. And so that's why I want to talk a little bit about the Tanja Rico, but do a comparison to this F-150, which I think is probably the best full-size truck out there right now based on based on value principle. If you enjoyed my video, please give me a thumbs up, make some comments, and if you haven't done so yet, would you kindly subscribe as well. Until next video, I'm signing off for now. Thank you so much.